Hello, welcome to our webinar and thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. We're happy to partner again with the Options Clearing Corporation or OCC to bring you this webinar today on how dividends can affect options. My name is Gina Bokaius and I'm on the management team of Regal Securities, which is the parent company of eOption and its sister company, InvestTrade. A few housekeeping matters before we start. The session today will last one hour. Our speaker will present for approximately 50 minutes or so, and then he'll address your questions for the last 10 minutes of this presentation. We ask that you look now to locate the Q&A box on your screen. If you have any questions at all during the webinar presentation, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box throughout the presentation, and our speaker will answer those at the end. We ask that you use the Q&A box and not the chat box, as our speaker will only see what's in the Q&A box. And to tell you briefly about eOption, as our name implies, we're a brokerage firm that specializes in stock and options trading. We offer you some of the lowest rates around, including zero commission on stocks and ETFs, and options are just 10 cents per contract. Our founder was one of the founding members of the Chicago Board Options Exchange and has been an active stock and options trader for nearly 50 years. He created his ideal trading company that caters to those who have a passion for investing. And at eOption, we support trading education, and we usually do one to two webinars per month with industry experts, and we hope you'll continue to join us. We also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see our complete library of trading videos, no matter what level of investing you're at. You can go to youtube.com slash eOption and take a mo moment to subscribe now if you'd like. And now I'd like to briefly turn your attention to our disclaimer. We encourage you to make your own investment decisions and option trading does have risks. So if you could take a moment to view this screen and I'd like to turn your attention to the fourth bullet point where options carry a high level of risk and are not suitable for all investors. Certain requirements must be met to trade options through Regal or any of its divisions. Please read the options disclosure document titled Characteristics and Risks of Standardized Options before you start trading options. And if you need a copy of that, we do have a link on the screen, or you can email us at support at eoption.com, and we're happy to give you a booklet that describes the risks and different option trading strategies. So next, I'd like to turn our attention to our speaker now, Ken Keating, who is an Associate Principal of Investor Education at the Options Clearing Corporation. Ken has been a trader for 25 years and has worked on the trading floor of the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange and the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. He has held positions as a floor market maker, floor specialist, risk manager, and off-floor prop trader. He's also worked as an options portfolio manager as well as trading for himself. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ken now. Thank you. Well, thank you for thank you for that introduction, Gina, and uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. Gina, can you see my title slide? Okay. Yes, it looks perfect. perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Um, well, once again, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us here today. My name is Ken Keating, and I'm an associate principal at OCC Investor Education, as well as an Options Industry Council instructor, and I'll be giving today's presentation on how dividends can affect option prices. Um, so I just want to send a quick uh, shout out to Gina and Scott and all the great people at eOption for all they do for the ever-growing community of options investors with their competitively low rates and their amazing trading platform. So uh, before we get started, we also have to do a little housekeeping. We have our own disclaimer, very much like um, eOption, and um, do have to mention that options are rather complex vehicles and do involve risks. So um, once again, as Gina mentioned, anybody who's looking to trade options should read and understand the characteristics and risks of standardized options, and you can contact them for a physical copy, or you can always reach out to us at um, optionseducation.org to download a digital copy for free as well. In order to simplify the calculations used today, Commissions, fees, margin interest, and taxes have not been included. And lastly, any strategies discussed here today are strictly for illustrative and educational purposes. Okay, here are some of the trademarks and logos owned by OCC. You will see these throughout the presentation. So this is strictly for the legal department at OCC. 
All right, here is a great little chart. This is annual options volume over the last 20 plus years. So options actually started trading in 1973 on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. And on the very first day of trading, uh, I believe they traded something like 940 contracts. So options volume has really skyrocketed and taken off over the last 20 years. And as you can see, um, you know, even more so lately than than over the past 20 years. So 2008, as you remember, was the financial uh, the financial crisis, the um, housing crisis right here. 2011 was the sovereign debt crisis. 2020, we had uh, COVID and, you know, obviously we're dealing with what's going on in Ukraine and an election and whatnot. 2020 was a record year at the time where we cleared and settled nearly seven and a half billion contracts. And last year, we set an, another record where we cleared and settled nearly 10 billion contracts. So, so currently, we are on track to at least meet or exceed last year's record volume number. And we've been averaging this year roughly 41 and a half million contracts. November alone, we've been averaging 48 and a half million contracts. So we're, we're certainly on track to beat yes, last year's volume numbers. So as you can see, there's no lack of investors uh, using the product to both speculate and hedge amidst all the volatility that we've been witnessing um, over, over the many, many years, over the last 20 years of options trading. Okay, with that being said, let's get started. So today, this is today's presentation outline. So we're going to be talking about... Um, dividends and how they impact options and option pricing. So we're going to first delve into options pricing and do a review, a recap of options pricing. Then we're going to look at the impact of dividends on options pricing and how they impact the values of calls and puts. We'll then look at early exercise and assignment risk. We'll then get into what happens when a dividend is reduced or eliminated. And lastly, we will look at non-ordinary or also known, what are also known as special dividends and potential adjustments for those. And time permitting, at the end of the presentation, I will bring Gina back on and we will uh, answer some live Q&A. Okay, so options pricing. This is going to be a recap. So essentially, options pricing. Who makes options prices? So when you look at your options montage and you pull up a stock and you see, you know, different bids and offers and flashing lights and, and different strikes in different months, and you ask yourself, well, who's making all these prices? Well, all those prices that you see are certainly not random, okay? They are the collective market for anybody who's participating in that uh, option at any given time. So that could be individuals such as yourselves, individual retail investors. It could be institutional investors. It could be hedge funds. It could be banks. It could be pension funds. It could be professional market makers like I used to be, somebody who's making a two-sided market and facilitating order flow for the public. And when you see a market on any particular options, you have a, a best bid or best offer, also known as the NBBO or national best bid or best offer. So at any given time, that's a snapshot of, of that particular option at any given time. So what is an option ultimately worth? Well, simply put, it's only worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. And as traders and investors, we use options pricing models, which we'll get into in a few slides, to uh, to give us an idea of what an option is worth, it's more of a guideline, but ultimately it's the forces of supply and demand that override what is known as a theoretical value. So if at any given time you look at a market and you see stocks trading for 50 and you're looking at the out of the money 55 level calls and you see the market on those calls is $1 bid offered at 120. Okay, so the, say the market's willing to buy them for a dollar and sell them for a dollar twenty. So we would say fair value is right in the middle. It's about dollar ten. But if a huge order comes in to buy a large number of contracts, that's going to push the price of those options higher, maybe up to a dollar fifty or dollar sixty. On the on the flip side, if a huge sell order comes in, that's going to depress the price as there's going to be more supply 
it, for the then for the demand for those options, and then I'll pr put the you know move the prices lower. So ultimately, it's the idea or the concept of supply and demand that's moving options prices, and the prices that you see at any given time is simply a snapshot of the supply and demand for those options at that moment in time. So. Just like um, any product, uh, if you have a low supply and a high demand, you're naturally going to get higher prices. So, you know, if we see there's very few suppliers supplying apples and they're selling them at a dollar each and there's a lot of demand, that's naturally going to result in higher prices. This is something that we've all witnessed this year with, with inflation. We've seen gas prices go up. We've seen food prices go up, the price of bacon, the price of eggs. I mean, I was in the store the other day and a, like a tub of cream cheese cost $9. It's just, you know, food prices have just gone through the roof. So naturally, as you have a low supply and a high demand, that's going to equate to higher prices, no different than the options market. Now, on the flip side, a high supply and a low demand is going to equate to lower prices. So if all of a sudden those apples that were trading for a dollar that's going to attract more sellers, okay, more producers of apples. So as more sellers come into the market, you're going to have a greater supply and you're going to have more apples on the market. And that's naturally going to satisfy the demand. Maybe there's even going to be a drop off in demand. And now that's going to lower prices. Now apples are trading for 50 cents each. So once again, high supply, low demand is going to equate to lower prices. And it's no different for um, options. Now, as I mentioned earlier, options, traders will use theoretical pricing models to um, come up with an idea of how, you know, what an options fair value is. So once again, it's a useful tool that helps you understand a price um, and might help you establish a trading plan. So there are inputs that go into any model. So the inputs that go into a pricing model are the stock price strike price, the implied volatility, time to expiration, and the cost of money, interest rates less any dividends. And as you can see, um, when you put all these inputs into a pricing model, you're going to get an output. And those that output is going to be call and put premiums or what are known as theoretical values. Now, once again, the idea that there's supply and demand is going to weigh on the price of those options. So as you can see, when we put any of these variables into a model, our stock price at any given time is known, our strike price is known, time to expiration is known, and the cost of money, the interest rate at any given time is known. What is unknown is this idea of volatility. So, and once again, volatility is going to change based on the supply and the demand for options. When there's a huge demand and prices go up, essentially volatility is going up. And when there's a huge supply of options versus demand, um, the price is going to go down and volatility is going to become depressed. So there's two pricing models that um, there, there, there's many different pricing models, but two of the most um, popular models, I'm going to talk about the first one, which is known as the Black-Scholes pricing model. So this is the earliest and most widely known model. And this was developed in 1973 by Fisher, Black, and Myron Scholes. And um, it really revolutionized options trading. Now, this model, while as good as it was, had certain limitations. So some of the limitations for a Black-Scholes model is it does a good job at pricing European style options. In other words, options that expire only on expiration, okay? But it, it, so it assumes that there's no dividends, that volatility is constant, which we know is not the case. Volatility is always moving. It also assumes that short-term interest rates are constant. We know interest rates move. Um, so this is a log normal model. So what that means is um, that this Black-Scholes model, since it's log normal, means it does a good job at pricing options at expiration, but not such a good job at pricing the intervals uh, up before expiration, up until expiration. So um, some of the other limitations are that assumes that there's uh, no transaction or commission costs. 
that markets are efficient. And um, once again, we know that the direction of the market or individual stocks is not consistently predictable, okay? Because, you know, stocks and indexes are constantly moving. So, so while it's a great model um, and it, it models European options uh, decently, uh, it doesn't do a good job with American style options. So American style options, which are the options that most people are trading these days, can be exercised early on or before expiration for whatever reason the long holder wants. So the second model, a Cox-Ross-Rubinstein model, which came out in 1979, is a binomial model that it does a better job modeling American style options because it does take into account for early exercise. Um, and we're going to get into why somebody would exercise, but the main reason why somebody would exercise is for a dividend. So a binomial model essentially takes, I know that's a daunting, sounds very daunting, that, that, that term, but simply what that means is it takes the end price at expiration and works backwards. In other words, it breaks down time into many different intervals between now and expiration, and it takes today's stock price, and it assumes that it can go higher or lower from today's price. And once again, it takes into account early exercise. All right, so that being said, now let's look at the effect dividends have on options. So a little quick history about dividends and dividend yield. Essentially, dividends are payments made to shareholders on a per share basis, and it's paid out from the company through its net profits. So simply, the company is paying out its profits to shareholders, and typically this happens quarterly. So if you own 100 shares of a stock and it pays a 50 cent dividend, you would be paid $50 every quarter um, on your shares of stock. Now, the first company to pay a regular dividend was the Dutch East India Company, which was around for nearly 200 years. It's a trading company. And the annual average dividend yield for this company back then was 18%, which is an amazing return for almost 200 years. Well, unfortunately, the Dutch East India Company eventually was subjected to bankruptcy and was, was had to dissolve and was taken over by the Dutch government. But over this run here, it was a pretty decent return. So essentially, the dividend yield is calculated by taking the annual dividends per share and dividing it by the stock price per share. So here's the formula. So in this example, let's just say this, this stock that we have up here in the second bullet point, it's a $100 stock, it pays a 50 cent dividend quarterly. Okay, so that's $2 annually, $2 divided by 100, that's 2%. Okay, so we would say the dividend yield of this particular stock would be 2%. Now, this is the chart of the dividend yield of the S&P 500 over time. So going back all the way to 1871. So as you can see, the dividend yield over time has actually gone lower. Now, there's various reasons why the dividend yield has gone lower. Um, part of the reason, or the main reason, would be because the S&P over this time period has gone straight up. So as the index or stock goes higher, okay, the, the dividends are going to be a less, less of a percentage of the overall value of that security. So um, because the S&P 500 has gone pretty much straight up since over this time period, the dividend yield is also going to decrease, as well as the fact that these days, much of uh, executives get uh, stock-based compensation. So uh, because of that, maybe a firm might choose not to pay a dividend to its shareholders and might want to participate in a stock buyback. So when you couple together the fact that the market has gone pretty much up over this time period and that um, companies are using stock buybacks rather than dividends, that's, that's going to um, tell you a lot about why this dividend yield over time has gone lower. So, and some investors will view dividend yield uh, positively because it's a source of potential income on your securities over time. So um, 
Now let's talk about a few dates that you're going to want to have on your radar screen as far as risk is concerned when we are talking about dividends. So this next slide is going to give you a timeline of how dividends generally play out. So there are four important dates. There's the declaration date, the ex-dividend date, the record date, and the payable date. So the declaration date, the declaration date is simply the date that the board of directors announced the dividend. They will tell you the size of the dividend, the record date, and the payment date. Probably the most important of all these dates is the ex-dividend date. Okay, this is the date when new shareholders are disqualified from earning the dividend. So if, if um, you buy a stock on the ex-dividend date, you won't receive the dividend for that quarter. You'll receive it for the next quarter, but in order to qualify for the dividend, you have to buy it before the ex-dividend date. It's very important. Um, investors who buy shares on or after the ex-date will not earn that dividend. Um, so on the ex-dividend date, okay, the shares trade without the dividend on that ex-date. Now, the record date is the date that the company takes a snapshot of its books and it records who's a shareholder of record and thus who's entitled to receive that dividend. So this is generally one to two days after the X date. So if you buy a stock on the X date, remember stock settles T plus two or two trading days. So if you buy it the day before the X date, it will settle, you will be a shareholder of record and you will receive the dividend. If you buy it on the X date, you will not receive the dividend. Now the payable date is the date that the dividend is paid out to shareholders. And this is the date that you are likely to see that dividend payment hit your account. So once again, in kind of in summary, a dividend is generally a cash payment. It's paid out of company profits and it's paid quarterly to uh, its shareholders. And only equity holders or stockholders are entitled to dividends. Call holders aren't entitled to dividends unless, of course, they exercise their contracts in advance of the ex-dividend date. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So when a dividend is paid, okay, on the ex-date, the stock price will typically go down by the amount of the dividend. And so if it's a $100 stock and it's paying a dollar dividend, um, on the X date, let's say it goes X dividend tomorrow. So tomorrow arrives. And in theory, that stock should open up at $99. In other words, it'll drop by the amount of the dividend because shareholders have received a dollar. That stock price is going to drop by a dollar. Now, it, it, it might trade below 99. It might trade above 99. So it's certainly still going to be subjected to market forces, news, um, general market volatility, but in theory, that stock should drop by the amount of the dividend on the X date. Now, this last bullet point, the price of the stock and the price of its options are very much connected. So um, that seems like stating the obvious, but um, this statement is going to lead us to the second part of our discussion, namely how dividends and option prices are related and the risks inherent in that relationship. So on the next slide, we will see this relationship play out. All right. So if all of a sudden a company doesn't pay a dividend, decides to pay a dividend, okay, how that how is that going to affect the value of calls and puts? So remember, calls and puts are going to factor in any potential dividends that are Going, being paid and potentially could be paid, okay? So if all of a sudden a company decides to pay a dividend, that's going to negatively impact call premiums and it's going to um, increase the value of put premiums, okay? And this makes perfect sense because remember on that X date, the stock is going to drop by the amount of the dividend. So that's going to lower the value of calls and in theory, it's also going to raise the value of puts. So that's going to be factored in into the options prices for both the calls and the puts. Now, the opposite relationship is going to happen if the um, if there's a decrease in a dividend. If a company pays a dividend and then all of a sudden decides not to, that's going to impact call premiums to the upside, and it's going to decrease put premiums. 
So remember that higher dividends simply imply lower future stock prices because the company is paying out of profits uh, dividends to its shareholders. Okay, so um, you know companies that typically pay a lot of dividends, like utility stocks, um, you know, uh, financial company stocks, stocks that are you know that you don't you don't see them typically make huge moves either in either direction. They're pretty steady. Uh, they're pretty steady uh, movers. Um, and the higher dividends imply future lower stock prices because those those returns are essentially being returned to shareholders. So, and because of the fact that dividends are going to, uh, when the stocks go X dividend uh, and will drop by the amount of the dividend on the X date, that essentially is going to lower call premiums and raise put premiums um, in, in the options pricing. So, now let's talk about early exercise and assignment risk. So um, <clears throat> when we talk about assignment risk or exercise, so remember that only American style options can be exercised early. European style options can't. They can only be exercised on expiration. And most European style options are big indexes like the SPX or the Russell or the NDX. But the most for the most... Um, products that trade within the United States, they're American style options, and they can be exercised on or before expiration at any time. So, but remember that anybody who's trading an option decides to exercise that option early, there has to be a financial incentive in order to do so. And the reason why somebody might exercise a contract early is for a dividend. So, Remember that an investor must purchase that stock before the X date to receive the dividend. And for most people who, who trade options, probably the most popular option strategy is what's known as the covered call, where an investor will buy 100 shares of stock. Maybe they buy the stock at 100 and they sell the 105 or 110 calls, out of the money calls, in order to generate some income. So anytime you sell American style options, you are subject to early assignment um, at any time. Now, once again, there has to be an economic incentive for somebody to exercise early. And the reason why somebody might exercise early is for a dividend, which we will get into in the next few slides. So this is a very important formula that you're going to want to know if you're somebody who likes to sell covered calls or even maybe put on call spreads. So if the time premium, okay, in other words, the extrinsic value left in the call option is less than the amount of the dividend, then that option is a strong candidate to be exercised early for the dividend. So one way to kind of view how much time premium is left in your calls is by looking at the corresponding put. Now, this is due to a concept called um, put call parity. And I'm not going to get into an exhaustive talk about put call parity, but just know that options that share the same strike in the same month have a direct relationship to one another. So if a, if a you know the the if a stock is trading for a hundred, the 80 calls and the 80 puts, the 80 calls are twenty dollars in the money and have probably more mostly intrinsic value and very little time premium. The 80 puts are out of the money and have uh, are comprised of nothing but time premium, but the time premium in both the call and the put should be very similar, okay? So let's look at a, you know why somebody might exercise early for the dividend. So let's look at this example. So we have a stock, it's trading for 100, and we have eight days to go to expiration. And tomorrow it's going X dividend for 50 cents. So here we have various calls, uh, it's call strikes. We have the call market. We have the fair, fair value of, of the calls, which is just the midpoint of the bid ask spread. We have the intrinsic value of these calls, the extrinsic value or time premium in these calls, the dividend, which is 50 cents, and the corresponding fair value of the put. So as you can see, 
the 85, 90, and 95 puts with the stock trading 100, these are all in the money. These are $5 in the money. The 90 puts are $10 in the money. The 85s are $15 out in the money. So somebody, in this case, each of the, these dividends, this 50 cent dividend is greater than the time premium in the calls. So if the stock is going X dividend tomorrow, these, the 85, the 90, and the 95 level calls are strong candidates to be exercised early for the dividend. So think of it this way. If somebody exercises the 95 level call, okay, they're giving up roughly five cents in time premium and they're benefiting 50 cents, okay? Because remember what I said, there has to be an economic incentive to exercise early. So they're, they're foregoing five cents to gain 50 cents. Now let's look at the 100 calls. These are the at the money calls. These are comprised of nothing but time premium. So the extrinsic value for the 100 calls is $1.40. Now that's greater than the dividend of 50 cents. So it, somebody by exercising the 100 calls for the dividend doesn't make a lot of sense because they'd be foregoing $1.40 to make 50 cents. That's not to say that somebody would ex wouldn't exercise these. Some people might, you know, for whatever reason, I can't think of why, but, you know, stranger things do happen. But, you know, in all likelihood, these are not going to be exercised early. Um, so if you're somebody who likes to do covered calls and maybe the stock is going ex-dividend tomorrow for 50 cents and you you're maybe you bought these, uh, you sold these 95 calls when the stock was trading 80. Maybe you bought the 80, 80 stock and you sold the 95 calls against it. They were out of the money. Now stock is trading for 100. They're $5 in the money. And the stock is going X dividend tomorrow for 50 cents. So to mitigate against an unwanted assignment, if you want to keep your stock and you want to keep the dividend, you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to either one, buy back this out of the money or this in the money call Okay, so you don't get assigned, or you buy back this call and roll it to an at the money or out of the money strike. In other words, roll this strike up to mitigate against an unwanted assignment. And we get calls from investors all the time that say, Well, I had this covered call on, I got assigned, um, I woke up with a bunch of money in my account. What happened? Well, what happened is somebody exercised for the dividend. So they, 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 you know, you woke up, you, you know, they called away your stock. Um, and you didn't receive the dividend and they did. Okay. So you're going to want to know that formula if you're somebody who likes to do covered calls, or even if you're just doing call spreads, um, you know, that that's a very important formula to know. So once again, if the extrinsic value or time premium value of the option is less than the dividend amount, then that call is a strong candidate to be exercised early for the dividend. And typically the day that people would exercise for the dividend is the day before the X date, okay? But not to say that, you know, they couldn't be exercised two days before, three days before, you know, strange things happen, but, um, but typically the, the in the money calls get exercised the day before the X date. So under normal pricing scenarios, the value of the put will show you the amount of the extrinsic value left in the call. So as you can see, you know, due to put call parity, you know, these values should be somewhat similar. They're not because of interest rate considerations, but, you know, just know that sometimes you can cheat and you can say, well, you know, look at the corresponding put, you know, the 95 put has, you know, a fair value of 20 cents. That's still less than the 50 cents in the dividend you, you, that, that, tells you that this, this call is still a candidate to be exercised early for the dividend. And as you can also see, the in the money and at the money puts in this case are 50 cents more than the value of the calls. And that's due to efficient market pricing. So um, the dividend, as you can see, is being priced in the value of the puts. It raises the value of these puts, like these puts, these 105 puts, um, you know, the with the stock trading 100, fair value is is $5, okay, it's got 20 cents of intrinsic value, but the put's trading 570, why? Because that 50 cent dividend is baked into the price of that put. Same thing with these puts as well. Now, what happens when a dividend is reduced or eliminated? Okay, so once again, option prices generally account for potential dividends through price discovery. It's factored into the price of an option. 
So an increase in dividends, as we talked about earlier, generally lowers the value of calls and raises the value of puts. So a dividend reduction would have just the opposite, okay? A dividend redu reduction in, in <clears throat> excuse me, a reduction in dividends would raise the value of calls and lower the value of puts. Um, and that's because to a, that would, uh, to allow put call parity to hold. So now if a company de 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 decides to reduce a dividend, a stock may experience a decline following a dividend cut, okay? Because for various reasons that might indicate a weakening financial position, maybe they, the, the, the cash flow they're throwing off isn't as great as it was in the past, that might be a red flag. Um, you know, uh, various reasons, maybe uh, an investor was looking to get a 5% yield on their stock, but now the yield's 2%, that's not good enough for them. Maybe they'll just sell their stock. So there's various reasons why people, uh, stocks might go down following a dividend cut, but generally uh, it indicates that the company is, is having some issues. So once again, given, any, given all the other inputs uh, in a pricing model, you can actually sit back solve for the implied dividend that the options market is expecting because once again, those dividends that are known at, at any given time are priced into the price of the calls and the puts. All right, so now let's look at some non-ordinary dividends or what are also known as special dividends in any potential option adjustments. So contract adjustments in general. <clears throat> when adjustments are made for non-ordinary cash distributions, the following terms can be typically modified. So the deliverable of the option, the strike prices, the option symbol. So um, which terms or what terms are affected is going to, uh, is going to be dictated by whatever corporate action that necessitates the adjustment. So when I say non-ordinary, okay, um, what I mean by that is uh, non-ordinary is different from ordinary dividends. So a company that pays, let's say a company has paid a 50 cent dividend every quarter for the last 10 years, and that's considered an ordinary dividend. Now let's just say all of a sudden in the 10th year, or the fourth quarter of the 10th year, they decide to pay a dollar dividend. Well, Regardless of the fact that that dividend is larger than the 50 cent dividend that they've paid in the past, um, it's still considered an ordinary dividend regardless of size. In that case, a dividend adjustment typically wouldn't be warranted. Now, a non-ordinary dividend, if it's greater than 12 and a half cents and is paid outside the ordinary stream, that could be viewed as uh, a non-ordinary dividend and typically would be open to an adjustment. So depending on the nature of any possible adjustment, okay, the option symbol might stay the same or it might not. So if the deliverable, and we'll get into this in a few examples, but if the deliverable becomes something other than 100 shares, you will have, you'll see a numerical suffix after your options symbol. And if all of a sudden the deliverable changes to something like an XYZ from XYZ to XYZ1, this is a flashing warning sign to let you know that the deliverable is something other than 100 shares. So most options contracts deliver simply 100 shares. If that deliverable becomes modified in any shape or form, you'll see a numerical suffix. So this numerical suffix is a warning sign. Um, and if, you, if this happens to you, you should go to the OCC website in our information memo section to research why that deliverable has changed and how it impacts your options. Or you can just shoot us an email, we'll explain it to you. But many often, oftentimes after the options undergo some kind of adjustment, um, in many cases, exchanges will relist standard options that do deliver 100 shares after the fact. Okay, so... Um, just know that sometimes you'll see standard contracts trading alongside non-standard contracts. So let's look at some uh, examples. So we have company XYZ and it announces a non-ordinary cash dividend. 
And this dividend is $3.75 per XYZ share held by its shareholders. Okay, so it's being paid outside the ordinary dividend stream. It's greater than 12 and a half cents. In response, OCC might determine to adjust options as follows. So in this case, we're going to OCC decides to reduce the strike price for the option. So in this case, if strike prices were reduced, your number of contracts would remain the same. The deliverable would still be 100 shares, but strike prices would be lowered by $3.75. I'll get into why that is. The multiplier will remain 100, and the symbol will remain XYZ. So before the dividend is paid, let's say you were along the XYZ D50 call. Okay, let's say the stock was trading at 50. You're, you've got the at the money call, it's trading, uh, stock's trading 50, you have the 50 level call. Now, after the dividend is paid, you're going to be long the XYZ D4625 call. And the stock, in theory, because it's going to drop by the amount of the dividend here, should, in theory, open up at 4625. So the strike prices are lowered in this case to make option holders whole. So remember that you know, option holders are not entitled to any dividends, only stockholders are. So, um, and anybody who exercises their option is going to forego any time premium in that option. So to make option holders whole in this case, strike prices are being reduced by the amount of the dividend. So, you know, before the dividend, you had the right to buy 100 shares at 50. After the dividend, you're going to have the same right but now you have the right to buy shares at 46.25. So economically, nothing's changed. You still own the at the money contract, except that now you own the right to buy at $3.75 lower than you did before. So now let's look at a second example. So company XYZ decides to announce a special or non-ordinary cash dividend. And this dividend is $5.00. Or XYZ share held by its stockholders. So in this case, OCC might determine to adjust options in the following way. So in this case, the deliverable, the option, the special dividend of $5 is being added to the deliverable. So your number of contracts would stay the same. The deliverable would be go from being 100 shares of XYZ to being 100 shares of XYZ plus $500 in cash per contract. Your strike price would remain unchanged. Your multiplier would remain unchanged. And because the deliverable is something other than 100 shares now, you, be, you have this XYZ1 contract, that one indicating that the deliverable is non-standard. So before the dividend, you own the XYZ D10 call. After the dividend, you own the XYZ1 D10 call with a modified deliverable. And why this is important is I'm going to show you in the next on the next screen. So as I mentioned before, oftentimes that um, after all the options, if the option becomes adjusted due to a corporate action and the deliverable changes, all the options on the effective date will become XYZ1. And oftentimes the exchanges will relist standard option contracts that will trade alongside the non-standards that do deliver 100 shares, okay? So let's look at expiration if you've got these two contracts trading side by side. So with the stock closing at $7.50, you have a standard XYZ D10 call and it's out of the money, okay? It has zero intrinsic value. Most likely it's gonna finish out of the money because it only delivers 100 shares and it's $2.50 out of the money. Now look at the XYZ1 D10 call. It's in the money and has intrinsic value of $2.50. How did we arrive at that? Well, stock's price is, stock is trading $7.50. We add $5. And that gets us to $12.50. That's $2.50 above $10. So this, this call, the adjusted XYZ1 D10 call is $2.50 in the money. And um, you know, oftentimes these, uh, these adjusted options 
have very wide markets. So if you just pull up an option screen and you see these two calls trading and you see the stock is closed at $7.50 or trading around $7.50, you might see maybe, maybe the market on this call is $1 bid at $3, okay? And you say, well, God, why wouldn't I just sell that call for a dollar if it's $2.50 out of the money? That seems like free money. Well, it's not. Remember, this call is actually $2.50 in the money. You'd be selling it at a dollar. You'd be a dollar fifty underwater. You'd actually be losing money. So once again, that numerical suffix after an option symbol is very important. And it's really telling you that the option deliverable is modified. But in this case, um, uh, the reason why that the that the uh, that the stock is being, or I'm sorry, that the dividend is being added to the deliverable is, let's just say X Y Z had two dollar and fifty cent strikes with open interest. Well, in the first example where we lowered the strike by the amount of the dividend, you can't do that um, with a five dollar dividend with a two dollar and fifty cent strike because if you took a two dollar and fifty cent strike and lowered it by five dollars that would effectively yield a negative strike and you can't do that. So if the dividend is larger than the lowest strike with open interest, in that case, um, OCC would take the dividend and add it to the deliverable in this case. And that's why you would see the modified option symbol XYZ1. All right, so some dividend takeaways. Once again, higher dividends imply lower call premiums and higher put premiums. The X date is the date when new shareholders are disqualified from earning the dividend. So if you buy a stock on or after the X date, you will not receive the dividend. If you exercise a call on or after the X date, you will not receive the dividend for that quarter. It has to happen before the X date. A call holder isn't entitled to the dividend unless, of course, they exercise their contracts or unless there's a contract adjustment. And once again, early exercise may occur in the event of a dividend and generally occurs prior to the X date if the extrinsic value or the time premium left in that call is less than the amount of the dividend. So that's the one the dividend might be a strong candidate to be exercised early. So I know that was a lot. Um, that is the end of our presentation. Now, I know we have time, uh, some time left over. So I'm going to bring back Gina and we can entertain some live Q&A. But um, I just want to thank you for joining us here today. Um, Gina, are you there? Um, yes, I'm here. And so we do have a few questions. And while Ken is answering those, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. We're happy to answer any and all questions. So all you have to do is, is locate Q&A on your screen and type that in. Um, so the first question we have is, what does di diluted EPS mean, i.e. low this morning? Diluted EPS. Um, okay, so I'm not a stock analyst. <laughs> um, that could mean a lot of different things. I'm not exactly sure what diluted earnings per share really means. And the fact that it's low this morning, I, that's... That's 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 more of a question for an analyst. I apologize. I I, I can't really answer that question. Um, let's see. The second question: Once the X dividend date comes, can a company take back the dividend? Okay, so uh, you know anything can happen. I, I've never heard of a company um, taking back a dividend. I I, I mean I guess it's um, possible if they're in financial straits, they could claw something back, but I, I've never heard that happen. Um, but, uh, that would be a very interesting, um, scenario. Uh, but once again, I, I, I've never heard of an instance of where a stock has gone ex dividend and a company clawed back the dividend. It would be very unusual. Um, now, uh, if, if anybody has any, um, if you have any, uh, uh, stocks that have, have done anything strange or, or if you want to know like how a particular corporate action has played out in the past, you can always go to the OCC website. It's the the OCC.com. And we have an information memo section on our website where you can research um, past corporate actions, how they've played out. Um, and just know that uh, for corporate actions, there's there's no template as to how corporate action might play out, okay? They're all different and they're all treated on a case-by-case -case basis. So just because 
you know, a merger or uh, a rights offering or a dividend was treated in one fashion is no guarantee that it will happen in the future. So just know that they are handled on a case by case basis. Um, but in the case of dividends, like I mentioned before, um, as far as strike adjustments, the deliverable being added, uh, the dividend being added to deliverable, those generally are standard uh, procedures when it comes to non standard dividends. So um, it looks like we have a another question here. Um, I really do need a brokerage account. So when are you going to accept Nigeria? Okay, I guess that that would be more of a question for you, Gina. I can't. Yeah, answer. sure, I can answer that. Yeah. Um, so at eOption, we do accept accounts throughout the world, um, but unfortunately, Nigeria is not on our approved list right at this time. So if we do have folks from other countries out there, um, you can go to our website, and there is a page on the different countries where we accept accounts, and and you can see that. Um, but unfortunately not at this time do we accept Nigeria. Um, so I think that looks like everything um, for questions right now. So I will wrap it up. So thank you, Ken. Um, that was very interesting and informative. And I really like the slide that you had on dividend takeaways. That was a good summary. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. And just a few reminders before we go, um, a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow on eOptions YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of our videos. And that's at youtube.com slash eOption. And we also put some direct links in the chat um, box for you as well on that. And as a special bonus for all of you attendees today, we'll also have a promotion on our YouTube channel where you can get free stock when you open an account. And that's only for a limited time. So you want to subscribe so you don't miss it. Um, the promotion link, you, you'll be able to find it when you go to our YouTube channel and you look up this video tomorrow and you'll see a description of the video and you'll see a line item that says special promotion and that'll have all the details there. And at eOption, if you're ready to trade options with us and stocks, you can get some of the lowest rates around and you'll see on the screen stocks and ETFs are just zero commission and options are just 10 cents per contract plus $1.99 per trade. And we also offer very low margin rates for those of you who trade on margin. And you can also use our, we have a trading platform as well as a very easy to use mobile app. And at eOption, we do support education and we have many resources on our website to learn about trading. We have videos, clickable option strategy links and information on how to use our free trading tools. And those are valued at over $500 annually, but it's free for all our customers. And if you have any questions about how to use any of our features on our website or our tools, we're always here for you. You can contact our customer service department at support at eOption.com or we're always happy to take your phone call and that's at 800-793-5333. And last, um, our, ne our next webinar is just, uh, we just finalized. It's on Wednesday, December 14th at 1 p.m. Central Time and it's stocking stuffer option strategies for the holidays. That'll be a fun one. And you can reserve your spot today if you'd like at eOption.com slash webinars. So thank you again for your time. We greatly appreciate it. And we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Bye now.